Good evening, everyone. I'm meteorologist Dave Snyder with the National Weather Service. Thanks for joining us for Alaska Weather Tonight. Wherever you're watching from, we appreciate it and certainly welcome your weather reports anytime. Simply go to weather.gov slash Alaska and you can click on the map, get to your local weather service office page there and submit a weather report if you've got something important or uh, damage that happens because of a storm or a snow total in southeast. We'd love to hear it anytime. Uh, send a picture of what your thermometer looks like if you're tracking that from the interior where temperatures have been 30 and 40 below. Big time cold. We'll talk about that here in just a minute. In the meantime, you can always check your weather forecast by calling us on the Alaska Weather Information Line. You know that number, 1-800-472-0391. And again, there's our website. If you can't find uh, what you need on the website, feel free to email me, david.snyder at noaa.gov, and I'm happy to serve you any way I can. Uh, let me know what I can do. Here's a look at the significant snowfall accumulations that were posted about around midday or so from the uh, fine folks of the National Weather Service office in Juneau. You're looking at central and southern parts of southeastern Alaska here, so we could see as of earlier today, uh, Wrangell, the airport there, had about 7 inches of snow. Uh, just a little bit south of Petersburg, about 12 inches, over a foot of snow in that region there and still falling around Petersburg. Uh, Point Baker, uh, Edna Bay up towards Sitka had about 2 to almost 7 inches of snow. And the further south you go toward Craig, about one and a half inches there, certainly warmer air moving through the region, so it reduced a little bit of the snow. But we still have a winter storm warning posted for the Misty Fjords area, including Hyder, where as of about midday, they'd had about five inches of snow, but storm snowfall totals by the time it's all said and done, uh, that could be upwards of one to two feet. A winter storm warning is still in effect there and will be through Friday afternoon. So big time snow still possible across some parts of southeast and a winter storm warning is in effect still for the Juneau area looking for about 12 to 18 inches of snow by the time that's all said and done. Again, that'll be Friday afternoon as that is wrapping up there. So uh, still looking at significant snow. There's still some potential for uh, accumulating snow around the Chichikov Island area. That'll probably go through the overnight areas. Uh, into uh, Angoon until about 9 o'clock or so, maybe as much as a foot in that region. So we're still talking about a very efficient snow machine hovering right over southeast through the remainder of tonight and early tomorrow for sure. And again, that is going to affect the capital city and certainly areas around Hyder as well. Now, what else do you see on the map? A little bit of yellow. That is an advisory uh, around the Thompson Pass area. Conditions there are improving now. A wind chill advisory has been posted. However, as we go through the remainder of the night, conditions should be improving for those regions. So wind chill advisory likely to go down. Uh, we had been looking at wind chill possibilities of 45 below in there. So thankfully that is getting better. Out around the Kuskokwim Delta though, a wind chill advisory is posted. That'll go through noon on Saturday for temperatures that could feel as cold as 55 below. So big time cold. And when we're talking about that cold, you know well, but it's always worth to remind folks that uh, 30 minutes outside or less could produce dangerous frostbite. Certainly hypothermia, but dangerous frostbite there in under 30 minutes when we're talking about wind chill values at 55 below. Now, all the red up north uh, is a wind chill warning. The yellow wind chill advisory is there. So for the Chukchi Coast, including Shishmaref, including areas up toward Point Open north of Kotzebue and the central and eastern Beaufort Sea Coast, uh, wind chill advisories there for values of uh, about 50 to 55 below. Certainly cold enough to give you uh, dangerous amounts of frostbite in a very short amount of time. The wind chill warnings are worse though, and that includes the Kobuk and Noatak valleys, both the lower and the upper areas, which reaches into Ambler itself, of course, the far west, and generally west of the Dalton Highway. Uh, in these regions, we're looking at wind chills that could be 55 to 65 below. And those areas, again, are looking at uh, warnings that will extend through tonight and well into tomorrow, in some cases probably longer. So big time cold already on the thermometer, plus the wind, it's even worse. So be extra careful, limit outside activity, and make sure if you do have to go out, you have a plan, someone knows you're going, when you're expected back, and again, uh, make sure you cover 
everything up. Here's just one place that I took a look at this afternoon. The temperature in Ruby, not under an advisory or warning now, but the temperature in Ruby was 34 below at around 3 o'clock or so, and the wind chill was down to 53 below. My goodness, that's cold. But an added bonus when it is just that rat nasty cold, uh, you can certainly see at least a little bit of the uh, clear sky. It is a very still uh, conditions there around Ruby this afternoon. So uh, there you go. Here's a look at a satellite picture uh, looking down on Alaska from about, oh, let's see, about what, 16 miles or so. And you can see southeast and what's going on across the central and southern parts of southeast. Broad area of low pressure here just pushing a copious amount of moisture northward and into cold air. That makes a beautiful snow machine around the capital city and the inside passages there. All the way down to the misty fjords. This weather maker is continuing to press northward here on a strong southerly flow. When we get to the aviation maps here, you'll see that southerly wind here on the north and western side of a ridge that's sitting down the west coast. So all this is working on the northern fringe of a weather pattern that's anchored much further south than we are right now. What you can see out to the west, too, is this beautiful, expansive area of low pressure, but it is a deep, deep North Pacific cyclone, down to about 940 millibars. The front itself is working its way through the Aleutians. The strongest winds are across the southern bearing now. So yesterday, when we were watching this develop, we could see the very high winds and seas working very close to the Aleutians. It doesn't look like there's a tremendous amount of major impacts as far as wind goes across the Aleutians itself. But the seas and the winds will remain high for tonight and tomorrow, but they're certainly coming down very quickly as well. The center of the low-pressure system still sitting right about here, well southwest of Adak and south of Shemya. And at the last analysis was around 940 millibars, which is a beast in the weather world. But it's only a beast if it has impacts to you. And right now it doesn't look like there's any major impacts, probably slowing down some ship travel, working their way through the Great Circle routes there. We did see a few folks that uh, might have been parked in Safe Harbor, and good for you. Here's a look out at the west, and you can see that cold air working its way southward. Several disturbances are working across the Brooks Range, and a little bit of that stirring up the wind, certainly worsening the wind chill around the Dalton Highway areas and westward. Some light snow up across the Beaufort Sea Coast. Pockets of low pressure there across the northern Gulf. A much bigger system here across areas just outside of uh, southeast. Rain uh, moving in from central and southern parts of southeast northward. And then as that combines with a cold, of course, that turns into a beautiful snow machine. Uh, the main corridor of cold is right across the west coast. And the other good thing is this is allowing that ice edge to build generally to the south. There's that offshore cold blows out over the open waters. Low pressure is analyzed at 940 millibars this afternoon rain and snow across the Aleutians as we go. And as we get to tonight, you can see that front itself is still creeping its way northward. The low filling in quickly now up to 950 millibars. There's still going to be some wind and high seas with that. As the front moves across the eastern chain, do expect a steady south and easterly flow to continue there with pockets of rain, rain and snow as you move up towards Sand Point and across the Alaska Peninsula. Low pressure is hovering just outside of Prince William Sound. That may still draw some gusty conditions offshore. 998 millibars, not a terribly strong system and low pressure is still working up southeast. With that we expect snow to continue across the inside passage. A better chance you'll see some rain mixed with snow across the outer uh, coastal areas there, especially across the south as well. And then pockets of snow showers across the eastern Alaska range and also across the Brooks range where the snow and the wind will combine to make it kind of a cold experience. There's a better chance of cloud cover across the Kotzebue Sound region and generally along the Yukon Valley too. As we get into Friday, the front is draped across the Alaska Peninsula there. You can see pockets of snow showers along it. Look at our big low. That's already filled up another 10 millibars or so just in 24 hours time. So almost 960 out across southeast. Areas of rainfall continue. We're looking for snow to continue up across parts of the capital city, northward into the Lynn Canal. Southward, a better chance some of that's going to be rainfall and generally clear conditions for south central and southwest, but still miserably cold. As we get into Saturday, we start to see some changes. More clouds moving into south central. That's going to help to keep temperatures moving upward a little bit there. So certainly, uh, I wouldn't call it warm, uh, but certainly temperatures will be going up as we go into time. And again, our low pressure system here, not filling in quite as fast as it once was, but still hovering around 960 millibars. The fastest winds are going to move eastward into the Gulf, and you can see a steady southerly flow developing there, and a really decent east to westerly flow moving off the coast of western Alaska. That takes all of this cold that's here, and we're talking about the big, serious wintertime cold, 
and moving that over the open waters of the Bering, that's going to continue that very efficient production of sea ice, moving that ice edge further southward. Across the north and eastern Gulf, low pressure is still just a mess here. With that, we expect more snow across the higher terrain, uh, areas around Juneau and northward into the Lynn Canal, and that's going to keep moisture sloshed up across the north and eastern Gulf as we go through your Saturday. Let's take a look at temperatures because really uh, beyond the snow in southeast, that's really where the rubber meets the road right now, hopefully. Uh, we're looking at temperatures anywhere from 40 to about 45 below around Galena, up toward Ruby, as you head out towards southwest into Bethel, about 25 to 35 below there. Nome, 26 below, 25 below for Utkiavik, 21 below around uh, Kaktovik. Uh, some other colder temperatures around uh, oh, Fairbanks, probably 25 to 30 below, 35 below in uh, Eagle there. And our friend Katie sent us this really amazing picture on YouTube of hammering in a nail in a board with a frozen banana. Never seen anything like it. That was my most Alaska part of, of my day today. So thank you, Katie, for sharing that. As you look southward, 19 above in Kodiak and southeast looking at temperatures in the 20s and 30s. Highs there not really changing much as we get into Friday. 26 around Skagway might be one of the colder spots. Uh, Sitka about 37 uh, close to that around Craig and Klawak. Single digit highs around Cook Inlet 29 in Kodiak, 24 below in Fort Yukon, 28 below in Eagle, or 35 below in Northway. Uh, temperatures really not a whole lot different up across the north as you get a little bit further south and west. Places like Ambler 35 below, a little bit, uh, pretty close to the same there down uh, the Koyukuk into Ruby and Galena, uh, 21 below around Bethel, 25 above for St. Paul. Take a look at low temperatures Saturday morning. No big changes there, anywhere from 35 to 40 below across the interior. Up north, 25 to 35 below. Uh, Kodiak again, 27. Dutch Harbor on Alaska, 35. And high temperatures, uh, considerably warmer for most places as we get into Saturday, except for the And now, aviation weather around Alaska. Moving on to aviation weather now, IFR conditions are going to surround the northern side of that very powerful Pacific storm that's uh, crawling very close to the central Aleutians. IFR conditions there for the central and western parts of the Bering and also pulling up some moisture just south of Akiak in uh, the Kodiak Island region. NVFR north and west of that. Also looking at widespread IFR to start over southeastern Alaska, especially some of the central and southern areas, but that will be creeping up into the Chilkoot and White Pass area with expected snow to be fairly widespread. Up across the central and eastern parts of the interior, looking for IFR to start your Friday morning. That will continue to be fairly widespread, generally north of the uh, Yukon Flats and up across the Beaufort Sea Coast and westward, but generally south of Point Barrow and Wainwright. Uh, coastal areas west of that should be generally VFR. Look for IFR around St. Matthew and then southward into the Bering and also across the Alaska Peninsula from Kodiak and just outside of Hitchinbrook Entrance. And then IFR again, still fairly widespread across the inside passages of southeast. But MVFR starts to return a little bit more from Port Alexander and Sitka northward toward uh, the uh, Lynn Canal. As we get into Saturday morning, look for some minor improvements around southeast. Still looking at widespread MVFR through most of the Gulf, Prince William Sound, Cook Inlet, generally south of Kenai, and then south and western areas, especially the Capes, looking at MVFR with some interior areas of IFR. Uh, looks like fairly close to Bethel. Around St. Matthew, down toward the Pribble Offs in the central and eastern chain in the Alaska Peninsula, and IFR start for you in the morning. Hit and miss IFR for the north slope. That should continue to improve as we get into the afternoon on Saturday, with MVFR holding around, uh, well, let's say, Nuiqsut out toward uh, uh, Ukiavik and then southward as you get uh, into Atkasuk. Uh, many areas around the Gulf and certainly widespread IFR across the Bering and most of the chain and about the southern half of the Alaska Peninsula. So uh, probably a lot of interruptions continuing. Here's your pass conditions then as we look at tomorrow. Anaktuvik Pass and Adigan Pass look to stay IFR really through most of the day. As we get into Lake Clark and Merrill Pass, things look pretty good visibility and ceiling wise. Rainy Pass expect to MVFR start and slowly transitioning to VFR just like what we'll see in Windy Pass. Isabel Pass should see a similar pattern tomorrow. Gradual improvement as the day goes on. As we get into Mentasta Pass, looking for visual flight roll through most of the day. Tanita Pass, also looking for VFR. Portage Pass, VFR toward MVFR as we go throughout your day. And Chilkoot and White Pass should see some improvements 
but right now it looks like at least an IFR start through a good chunk of the midday. Freezing levels show some warmer air is nudging its way up into the central and southern parts of southeast levels as high as two to 4,000 feet, but really most of the state remains below freezing and the surface freezing line coming right over Gustavus, up toward about Yakutat, and then south toward Akiak and Kodiak Island, all the way south toward Sand Point, Cold Bay and Falls Pass, and up into the Bering Sea. Uh, icing potential is generally lower around the southern Bering Sea. You can see the uh, region here above 2,000 feet, isolated moderates expected there, as well as areas around Cordova to Valdez, outside Hitchinbrook entrance, and uh, not quite to Seward, but getting close there. Watch for some patchy areas of ice. Also, a uh, fairly widespread icing potential from Kodiak Island southward down the Pacific coast of the Alaska Peninsula and for the central and southern parts of southeast, generally above six to 8,000 feet there as that moisture is moving in. The jet stream looks just kind of crazy right now. The main path of the Pacific jet is right here, 160, 165 knots or so coming in from pretty much west to east out of eastern Asia. But then we have this ridge of high pressure that's just snaking its way over the Bering and through interior Alaska and connects with a very large cyclone here across the interior of Alaska. So that low pressure is certainly helping to keep the cold locked in place. And then a broad southerly flow coming up the Pacific Northwest, also adding more moisture and occasional storminess to southeast, which is what we're seeing now. There's the low at 9,000 feet. Uh, some faster moving winds here on the south side of that coming over the Kenai Peninsula and the southern Alaska Range. A ridge of high pressure out of the pack northwest helping to keep that southerly flow going and storms moving into southeast. And then the cold being pushed offshore across the northern interior and down the west coast, but meeting up with a broad area of low pressure across the central and western Aleutians. Uh, the fastest winds there are still way out across the western bearing, but you can see that southerly flow here at 3,000 feet is a little bit faster at times, some 50 knotters there around the Misty Fjords region, and then a broad easterly flow again coming across the Brooks Range. Some of that is picking up speed too, 20 to 40 knots. You'll see some turbulence in a moment with that. And then convergence, the wind's coming together, speeding up because it has to in order to keep things moving along. 40 to 65 knots here out across the central and southern Bering Sea, including the Aleutians. So turbulence for sure, focused across the chain below 4,000 feet, looking for some isolated severe across the Brooks Range tomorrow below 5,000 feet, certainly chop extending into the Yukon Flats and southward looking for continued areas of turbulence across the southern parts of southeast too. Which night is the lunar eclipse? Welcome to Stargazers. I'm James Elberry, director of the Kika Silva Plot Planetarium in Gainesville, Florida. And I'm Dean Regas, astronomer for the Cincinnati Observatory. We're here to help you find your way around the night sky. Next week, we get to experience a total lunar eclipse. That's right, Dean. Every six months, Earth is treated to both solar and lunar eclipses. But timing and location is everything, and with this eclipse, knowing the date of the eclipse can be a little tricky. What are we talking about? Let's show you. First, let's talk about how eclipses work. Celestial bodies cast two shadows, a darker inner shadow called the umbra and a lighter outer shadow called the penumbra. Your location with respect to these shadows will determine the kind of eclipse you can see. The geometry of a lunar eclipse is quite simple. First, the moon must be in the full phase, putting the Earth between the sun and moon. When the Earth, moon, and sun align perfectly, we get eclipses. Because the moon's orbit is tilted by about five degrees with respect to the Earth's orbit around the sun, the Earth, moon, and sun rarely align. However, when they do, the moon passes through the Earth's shadow. Since the Earth is so much larger than the moon, our entire shadow can cover the moon. How high above or below the Earth's shadow the moon passes determines the type of lunar eclipse we can see. If the moon only passes through the Earth's penumbra, we have what's called a penumbral lunar eclipse. This causes only a slight dimming of the moon and is sometimes unnoticeable to the casual moon watcher. If only part of the moon passes through the Earth's umbra, the darker inner shadow, we have what's called a partial lunar eclipse. This causes a noticeable darkening of a portion of the moon's surface. However, if the moon passes completely into the Earth's umbra, we have a total lunar eclipse. Six months ago, there was a total lunar eclipse on July 27th. North America was on the daytime side of the world, so we didn't get to see it. 
And six months before that, on January 31st, 2018, there was another total lunar eclipse. People on the west coast of the United States were able to see the entire event. However, those of us on the east coast were only able to see the beginning of that eclipse. This time, though, almost everyone in the continental United States will be able to experience this total lunar eclipse. And it's all about timing. For simplicity, we'll use Eastern Standard Time. Make sure you adjust the time accordingly for where you live. For those of us on the east coast of the USA, the penumbral phase of the eclipse will begin at 9.37 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, Sunday night, January 20th. That's important because most official eclipse timings have the date set for Universal Time, which is referenced in England. On their calendar, this eclipse occurs on Monday morning, January 21st. We're both experiencing the eclipse simultaneously, but depending on where you live, your watch will have a different date. The eclipse won't begin to get interesting until almost an hour later, at 10.34 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, when the moon begins entering Earth's umbra. Then watch the moon as the umbra gradually crosses its surface. At 11.42 p.m. EST, the moon will have completely entered the Earth's shadow, and that's called totality. During totality, the moon will take on a reddish appearance for a little over one hour, changing various shades of red due to the sunlight being refracted by Earth's atmosphere. Each total lunar eclipse is different when it comes to how dark or how red it will become. How dark will this one get? Only the shadow knows. Totality will end at 12.43 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, Monday morning, January 21st, and the moon will completely leave the umbra by 1.51 a.m. Pray for clear skies, because even though lunar eclipses happen every six months, this will be the last total lunar eclipse until 2021. That's right, James. The next eclipse this coming July will just miss totality, and the four after that will all be penumbral. But be encouraged. In May 2021 and May 2022, we get total lunar eclipses again. So be sure to mark your calendars. And set your alarm clocks as you keep looking, looking up. And now, marine weather around Alaska. And on to your marine weather now. The latest ice edge analysis shows that ice is still building to the south and to the west, south and west of Cape Newenham, uh, certainly well away from the Pribilof Islands. Uh, getting closer to St. Matthew, yesterday the edge was analyzed at about 50 to 65 nautical miles uh, to the north and east of St. Matthew Island. Uh, looks like marginal ice is also expanding outward away from Bristol Bay, and with the continued areas of very cold air pushing offshore, the ice edge will continue to expand in that area. We're also looking at marginal ice down around Calgan Island in the Cook Inlet region, expanding, uh, expanding down the coastline, close to the Kenai River mouth and even further south, and just a little bit of ice there around uh, the Homer Harbor there, so you can see that. Uh, as you look at some of the cams in some places there. Friday's rain forecast in the southeast looking a lot better. Winds are coming down. Northerlies in the Lynn Canal, though still a little bit up there, 25 knots with a 5-foot sea. Southeasterlies at 25, 6-foot seas there in the Clarence Strait region. Otherwise, uh, southerlies south of Sitka, 15 knots with 10-foot seas. And northerlies across the northern part of the Gulf, you're looking at about uh, 7 to 9-foot seas on Friday. Uh, winds will come up again on Saturday with more of an offshore flow for the outer coast, 20 to 25, 13 to 14-foot seas as you head south of Sitka and Port Alexander. Northerlies diminish a little bit in the northern Lynn Canal and in south or north and east winds will start to pick up through Stevens Passage in the Clarence Strait looking for about three to seven foot seas on the inside for your Saturday. For south central winds are generally light I would say compared to other places in Alaska anyway. Northerlies in Prince William Sound with a three foot sea. West and southwesterlies across the northern Gulf with seven foot seas there. Northeasterlies coming down Cook Inlet really pick up speed over the ice. Uh, you'll notice that uh, we've got 25 knots south of Kenai, 7 foot seas there, 8 foot seas across the western barrens on Friday. And then winds come up sharply on Saturday again with an east and southeasterly flow coming across the Kenai Peninsula. 25 to 35 knots across the northern Gulf, 25 to 40 knots across the Cook Inlet region again with seas as high as 14 feet west of the barrens, 13 feet to the east and four foot seas inside of Prince William Sound on a 20 knot wind. For southwest, northeasterlies are blowing over the ice for Bristol Bay, 30 knots and six foot seas there, 12 foot seas 
further down the coast in the Bering. You'll notice a north and westerly wind there across the western Gulf over south or over Kodiak Island. Uh, northeasterlies over Chillicothe Strait with a 25 knot wind and 8 foot seas. They're 19 foot seas though building around Sand Point. Becoming southerly as that next front pushes through on Saturday, 30 knots with a 20 foot sea. Looking for easterlies and southeasterlies down the Bering Sea coast of the Alaska Peninsula. And a broad southeasterly flow is coming up over Kodiak Island. Anywhere from 10 to 14 foot seas there surrounding that region as we go through your Saturday. For the Aleutians, remember that front is now north of the island. Low pressure will remain to the south. So we've got kind of two surges that we're looking at. One of those south of Atka, Nikolski, and Alaska, looking at 25 to 35 knots there in seas from 24 to about 29 feet. North of that, you can see the peak in the higher seas, north of Shemia and Kiska especially, even well north of Adak. Uh, some of those seas ranging in the 30 to 35 foot range there. But generally, we're going to be dealing with areas closer to the coast that are not quite that bad. Anywhere from 35 to about 50 knot winds, the strongest of which will be out in the west. Uh, you're looking at seas that could stretch to about 33 feet out in the west, but most areas to the central and eastern chain looking at about 18 to 19 foot seas. Uh, conditions greatly improve on your Saturday, looking at south and southeasterly winds 20 to 25 knots, 11 to 16 foot seas in the central and eastern chain. Still looking at some pretty high seas and winds there out around Shemi though, a northeasterly flow 50 knots and 36 foot seas for your Saturday. Across the west, north and east winds coming down over the ice, generally 15 to 25 knots, a little bit stronger as you get to St. Paul and St. George though. 40 knots out of the east and 17 foot seas for Friday and rough as you go for St. Matthew, 30 knots and 17 foot seas. There are heavy freezing sprays, certainly a possibility as we go through the weekend here, especially as that ice edge is moving southward and that cold air is going north. So be extra careful out there, friends. North and easterly winds across the Beaufort Sea coast and the Chukchi. Northeasterly is up to 25 there outside of Kotzebue Sound, all over the ice, of course. For Saturday, not a big change. You're still looking at about 20 to 25 over the Chukchi and through the Bering Strait into St. Lawrence Island and 15 knots over the Beaufort. Once again, wind chill warnings continue for the Brooks Range, wind chill advisories for the Kuskokwim Delta and into the Bristol Bay region. Uh, we're talking about uh, values that could feel as cold as 50 to 65 below in some cases. Warnings up across uh, the Brooks Range, especially west of the Dalton Highway and south of Umia, it could be as cold as 65 below. Be extra, extra careful. In the meantime, uh, winter storm warning continues for the capital city in the Misty Fjords area. In those regions, you could see up to a foot of snow or so around Juneau and one to two feet of snow around Hyder. Have a good evening. Stay safe. These forecasts are for planning purposes only. Call 1-800-WX-BRIEF for a formal pre-flight briefing. Always file a flight plan before you go flying. The U.S. Coast Guard Auxiliary urges you to leave a float plan with a friend or the harbormaster before you go boating.